Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. A little news before we start with Dr. Fine. First and foremost, the political battle between Rhode Island and New York uh, rages on this morning. Uh, earlier this afternoon, Governor Cuomo at his state press conference said that he had spoken to Governor Raimondo last night after he had threatened to sue the state of Rhode Island as the order intercepting New York cars he claimed was unconstitutional. He said he spoke to Governor Raimondo and that she had agreed to rescind that executive order. Just a few minutes ago, Governor uh, Raimondo said, well, another executive order uh, supersedes the New York order, uh, and then went on from there a little less clarity than what Governor Cuomo said, trying to get clarification from the governor's office on that. Uh, governor uh, also went on to say that she is uh, adding some other restrictions, including on daycare services. We'll have that up in about a minute on Go Local Live, but let's go to Dr. Fine. Dr. Fine, thanks for joining us on a Sunday. There's been a tremendous amount of news over the weekend re regarding the coronavirus. Uh, let's specifically get into the announcements from the governor this, uh, today relative to new numbers in Rhode Island. So uh, it's nice to be here, of course. Uh, we, hear, we heard about 55 new cases and 33 people in the hospital. I don't think we have ICU numbers yet, and it's the ICU numbers that are most critical. That sudden jump in number of new cases is totally not surprising uh, because it's pretty clear that we are testing more people. As the number of tests come up, the number of new cases are, is going gonna, is gonna to grow and probably grow, you know, almost exponentially as we bring as we go from testing about 150 people a day to testing about a thousand. The challenge from my perspective is making sure the most at risk populations actually get tested. People in the most densely part densely populated parts of the state, um, in Cranston and in, in Providence, the densely populated parts of Providence in Central Falls and in Pawtucket and in Woonsocket, um, our core cities, they are the places least likely to have testing and the places that need testing most. Uh, the one number that stands out is from Wednesday to today's numbers, five days, we see a doubling uh, in the number of cases in Rhode Island with very, very limited testing going on. That's got to be a worrisome number for you. You've raised that concern about doubling every five days. Obviously, if that trend continues or shortens to three or four days, uh, those numbers get large very, very quickly. Um, they get large very quickly. And again, I'm going to pay attention to that, but I'm also going to pay attention to the doubling of people in the ICU. Um, if doubling of numbers of beds in the ICU occupied uh, happens quickly. Um, we're going to get underwater pretty quickly. Understanding we have 160 to 180 ICU beds in total. We were uh, at 11 yesterday. Um, and if that were to double every week, every, every three to five days, I think we're, uh, we exceed our ICU capacity uh, in two to three weeks. Uh, it looks like of those who are tested and coming out positive, we're pushing up against 300 now, and the number in a hospital, in hospitals that are now getting treatment, that's running at about 11 or 12 percent, just doing quick top of the head math. Uh, that's a significant number as well. Sure. Um, but again, we're only testing people who are sick. Right. We're pe testing people who are most likely to be positive from Jump Street. The people who are positive and not yet sick, are the ocean of people that we have to be concerned with, understanding that it usually takes three to four weeks from when a person is sick to, to when they end up in the ICU, sometimes shorter. Um, and so our ICU numbers are gonna lag a, a week, two, three, maybe four, behind uh, the, uh, the number of people who have the disease. Um, the number of tested yesterday, we don't have numbers today. That'll probably come out the, usually a uh, press briefing comes out at about six o'clock with all the data. Uh, yesterday was 2,700, I believe, Massachusetts. That's 2,700 since this issue began in 
functionally March 1st here in Rhode Island. Um, according to Massachusetts officials, they did 3,500 tests yesterday. You make the point that, listen, it doesn't matter if you test, if you don't do anything with the testing uh, data, but it also does, it, it also points to that we just can't get this testing protocol up and off the ground here in Rhode Island, even after almost a full month. I know there's concerted work on it. You know, the governor has promised that we'll be up to a thousand by the end of the week. That will be a great thing. But then we have to be effective in the other piece, which in my view is to build uh, isolation hospitals. Um, that's what testing really helps us make best use of. And that's where we need to get going uh, as soon as we can. We are using a strategy of in-home isolation, uh, but I don't know of any evidence that supports the notion in-home isolation is terribly effective. We know that most people who get the disease get it inside their own homes from other people who they live with. So one of the things that I'm hoping we'll do is really elevate the understanding of what to do in somebody's house when they're sick um, and really push that people need to isolate in a room by themselves um, and not be in contact with the rest of their family. I think there's good reason for people who are sick at home to wear a mask um, to prevent uh, the formation of respiratory droplets and the broadcast of those droplets inside the house I think that person needs to use a separate bathroom if possible um, and really maintain real isolation by, you know, having their own laundry basket and having their own uh, garbage and getting all their food on paper plates so they don't have to interact with the, much, with the rest of the family as much as possible. And, uh, and Dr. Alexander Scott said this yesterday and the day before, but I want to kind of underline it as much as possible because it's really, really, really important. And that is when one person in a household is sick and is self-isolated from the family, the rest of the people in the household need to isolate in the house and not interact with the rest of the community until that one sick person gets better um, and in the hopes that no one else in the household gets sick. That responsibility um, to isolate if a family member is sick is really important if we're going to, to try to, to, to make best use of home isolation, um, understanding that I'm not convinced it's going to work. But if we're going to make a, a, a go for it, um, we've got to get people to really be thoughtful about how they're isolating when they're sick and what their families are doing in that household. Uh, doctor, if you do the math based on uh, what's, what's the surge uh, math now, in two weeks, we'll have about four to 5,000 positive tests and we'll have about 500 people in Rhode Island hospitals. Uh, are we at the breaking point at 500 folks in the hospitals? I don't think at 500. We have 3,000 hospital beds. Um, and I said about between 160 and 188 ICU beds. It's the ICU beds that will uh, make us or break us at the end of the day. Um, and the question just is when we get to that capacity, there's good published evidence that rapidly increasing the number of ICU beds um, makes this a more doable process. It makes it so that you can get through it quicker and get to reopen quicker. And what I am hoping we will see soon um, is a rapid increase, perhaps a doubling of the number of ICU beds we have available to us and the number of ventilators. That will really help us move through this quickest, even if our, uh, our isolation process and our social distancing process isn't as effective as we want in reducing the, in the, the height of the curve, in reducing the number of cases we get all at once. We've got to do all these things and got to do them all at once, which is the real challenge. Uh, yesterday, I think the governor may have shocked people by saying she only thought 50 percent of Rhode Islanders were actually complying with the social distancing uh, restrictions. And that's why she cracked down on closing 
uh, a wide swath of uh, additional retailers and putting further restrictions, closing down daycare at least for this week, coming week, uh, et cetera. Uh, were you surprised when you heard that number that she only thinks 50%? And, and what can be done? Uh, we, we checked yesterday. No one's been arrested. No one's been detained. No, there's been no prosecution. Can she just lecture Rhode Island to, com to comply? Or does law enforcement de facto need to step in and at least start writing some tickets? Well, I think we, we need law enforcement in two ways. Um, I think the big way is we ought to put uh, law enforcement in, in cruisers and have them use their public address systems and go up and down streets reminding people of the importance of staying home and of doing a couple of other things. I think that will send a message in a way we've never sent it before so that people really hear it. And that's particularly important uh, to, to happen in a couple of languages and particularly important in our more densely populated cities. And then, yes, unfortunately, I think using law enforcement uh, to sanction people um, who are not in, who are not adhering to these recommendations uh, is is going to be a useful tool. Um, you know there is a history of this. You know the the thing we all forget is tuberculosis. That once upon a time uh, we had to isolate people with TB. We built some of our hospitals just for that purpose. Memorial Hospital got built as a tuberculosis sanitarium. Right. Uh, and you know. Uh, we, we've actually got a couple of old sanitariums around. Um, and we, in those days, uh, used to have the legal authority to uh, actually imprison people if they weren't in compliance with treatment. We may have to go back to that, at least in the short term, to get people to pay attention um, and to get people to pay attention now. Um, doctor, you're, you're talking to colleagues, not only in Rhode Island, but in other places. Um, what's the level of stress, fear, and do you get any sense of, does anybody get a sense of how long this will be? Um, I think most of my, let me answer the, the last question first. I think most colleagues are thinking a couple of months um, and expect a kind of stuttering process where we get ahead of it initially and then we open up a little bit and then we'll have outbreaks and have to focus on those outbreaks. Uh, the level of stress is a function of where people are. My colleagues in New York are stressed beyond belief. And I think I read a letter from one of them. I'm continuing to hear from him. Uh, he had he actually wrote me how particularly painful it was to hear about the Rhode Island restriction on New Yorkers. Um, and then uh, colleagues in the rest of the country, I think, depends on where in the evolution of this uh, epidemic uh, their particular localities are. Um, clearly, there's two Americas in almost every facet, uh, wealthier areas and poorer areas. We've talked a little bit about how we think this might impact Rhode Island. How serious is this going to be in uh, the urban core, amongst the homeless, people that live in very, very dense uh, congregations and really no options to separate? I think that's where we're going to see a differential impact, that we're going to get, you know, more deaths and more serious illness in people living in poverty and in, in the homeless. Um, I, I think, as I've been thinking about it, there is uh, likely to be a, a benefit I hadn't understood about social distancing. Um, and that benefit has to do with the, what, what might be called viral inoculum or viral load how much virus you get exposed to at once. That's bigger, a bigger viral load is likely in places where people are more densely populated. So I'm betting that we'll see much more illness in, uh, in, in poorer places, in more densely populated places. Um, and that's gonna, that's gonna be particularly painful as this goes forward. If there ever was an argument for building safe and healthy housing for all Americans, it is this epidemic. Um, what else do Rhode Islanders need to know, doctor, before we wrap up? I think the big thing is to, pay, to be prepared for isolation, you know, to get yourself a hibernation room. Make sure you have in that hibernation room 
everything you're going to need for seven to 14 days and prepare for the moment that you yourself get sick, as most of us will, or some most of us, I think, will at some point, and at that moment have the ethical and moral responsibility to lock yourself away for seven to 14 days and make sure you uh, not only protect the public, but protect the rest of your family. Uh, Dr. Michael Fine, thank you so much for joining us on this special segment on Sunday. Uh, for everybody, stay tuned. Uh, if today is anything like yesterday was, it's pretty much nonstop breaking significant news related to this uh, health and, and economic crisis that's hitting Rhode Island and the country. Uh, stay tuned. The governor's story is up now with the numbers and what she had to say. Uh, please stay tuned for updates throughout the day and into tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Fine at 12 News, the governor's press conference, and we'll also have uh, Commerce Secretary Stephen Pryor on talking about what the state's doing in leveraging the federal stimulus dollars to be able to get those dollars out to help Rhode Island businesses as quickly as possible. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Josh.